Well, I just want to start the stream by promising you no Star Wars spoilers. No, no, no. I get to go <sighs> see it at five today. I'm so excited. Ooh. But come hey. Monday, then all bets are we off. We still won't spoil Oh, it. man, really? <laughs> the only <laughs> problem is that I'm in this theater that has like super reclining seats as a feature. Yeah. Which is great. Mm. But it's a long movie and I know myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you'll be the one snoring. <laughs> The giant baseball mid of a seat. Yeah, I'm gonna say there's an 83 yeah. percent chance you're not gonna fall asleep in this movie, but I'd be curious. I fell asleep like, the I second time I saw last. Movie. No, I know. I know. That definitely happened to, to be a play at the Alamo Theater, and not only are there cushy seats, but there's beer, and that was mm -hmm. not yeah, the right. fast pace. Oh yeah, yeah, I had to like the whole like have a glass of wine with a movie. Great mm -hmm. in theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Just, do you want me to fall asleep or don't you? <laughs> All right, let's get rolling. You guys ready? All right. Yep. Here we go. Do you like listening to advertisements? Me neither. Want to help and support creators directly? Then head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support and help us reach our new milestone today. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 15th, 2017 from DTNS headquarters in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline at the Beach, I'm Sarah Lane. And joining us today, we've got a full house. Patrick Norton is here. He's going to tell us what to expect from televisions at CES and beyond. Thank you, Patrick. Doom. <laughs> Doom. <laughs> we will expect. There you go. That's it. Thanks for joining us. Uh, also here, author Rob Reed, author of After On, and of course, host of the After On podcast is here. We're going to talk a little bit about cryptocurrency. Boy, are we. Yeah. Uh, Len Peralta is here to illustrate cryptocurrency, the future of televisions, <laughs> and beyond. Or something completely different. There was a lot of news this week. so Yeah, yeah. No, we got a ton of news. And Roger Chang is putting it all together. He's He is... RPT Barnum. Wait, what? <laughs> the ringmaster. Right. right on. Ah, eh, sure. Why not? I'll Roger Chang, the greatest showman. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman announced he will head a multi-state lawsuit against the FCC to preserve the existing open internet rules. Schneiderman cited comments made to the FCC under stolen identities, and Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson believes the move violates the Administrative Procedure Act against arbitrary and capricious rules. The U.S. states of California and Washington are both considering rules to require net neutrality or ISPs could lose tax breaks and government contracts. Facebook's adding a snooze button to the top right drop down menu. It'll mute content from a person, page, or group for 30 days. If you don't want to unfollow them, you can just put them on snooze. Facebook also said in a blog post that research both internal and external shows that passively consuming information makes people feel worse than actively communicating with friends. Is that Facebook's mm. way of saying just post more? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> YouTube VR is now available on Steam for use on the HTC Vive. The free app is in early access, and some users have reported it's rather unstable. It's a little bit unstable. Uh, NASA announced that a neural network from Google has identified two new exoplanets, Kepler-90i, the eighth planet found orbiting near the star Kepler-90, uh, is the first solar system have as many planets as we have, or you know, we've discovered as many planets in a solar system as we have. The AI was trained on 50,000 signals that were already vetted to indicate whether or not a planet was there. It has analyzed 10% of the 150,000 stars in the Kepler mission, so there may be some more. Now, let's get into some other top stories, starting with a sad one, Sarah. Ah, uh, pour out a little liquor for AIM, AOL Instant Messenger is ending after 20 years of operation and yeah. its service today and there's no replacement service for aim which is you know it's been long in the tooth for a long time now but i was thinking about this earlier it aim was the first literally the first chat protocol where it was like oh, you could see the other person typing you know it was like this real-time thing that we're all right. so used to to this day but i it could was, do that on icq um, well, there was, I'm sure. I mean, it wasn't the only one, but it's like, think of just the lexicon of, yeah. of the way that people talk and, and how that all was, you know, spurred not by AIM, but by young people. What are your memories of AIM? Let's go around, let's go around the horn uh, and give one last eulogy for AIM. Rob, what, what do you remember best about AIM? Uh, never once getting around to installing it. 
Oh, that's very, that's very countercultural of me. And now it's beautiful too- sentiment. You didn't yeah. even have it in Netscape communicator that when it was just bundled in, I probably had it inadvertently, but by the time AOL bought Netscape, I was so long gone from Netscape. Patrick, what's, what's your best remembrance of aim? You know, I hated it or I thought I hated it until Facebook came along that I understand what hating any kind of social communication tool was really uh, about. Yes, it will be missed. It's such a, <laughs> another lovely sentiment as, yeah. as well. <laughs> Maybe maybe we should just uh, we should just move on from from eulogizing aim. <laughs> we come not to praise aim, but to bury it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, motherboard and Vice Media announced they will build a community network based out of the Brooklyn headquarters. The network will connect to fiber from an internet exchange, so it won't rely on a traditional ISP. It will also connect to the new New York City Mesh network an effort to provide community internet by Wi-Fi, also without needing an ISP. Project will document its creation with the aim of creating a guide to building an ISP for other communities. Motherboard, Motherboard points to NYC Mesh and Detroit's Equitable Internet Initiative as examples of community-owned networks that can bypass traditional ISPs. This would be great if Comcast and Verizon and AT&T and a lot of other scumbags, I'm feeling a little cranky this week, uh, hadn't already worked really hard to pass state laws that prevented municipalities from creating their own networks. There's already uh, straight restrictions. Going back to like 1996 after the Federal Telecommunications Act, um, 2004, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision where the tele- basically the Supreme Court said the Telecommunication Act would allow state to block municipalities from providing telecommunication services. Both instances turned into festivals for people from you know, you know mobile carriers and, and massive ISPs to start paying off legislatures to roll out bills that prevent community communities from creating legislation. Um, it's frustrating. Like there's like I, you know I want to say something close to 14 states. You know it's it's you know those uh, those, North- those bills are are finding more and more resistance than they used to, and yes. it wouldn't prevent this from happening. Because this isn't done by the government. It's done by the community, but not by the government. Okay, point taken. Uh, I just think in many cases it would be easier to organize it through the municipal government, but it's being blocked by the states. And yeah, it, it, we may have to, because I'm, I'm lucky, right? Because I'm using something called Common.net, which is an ISP startup uh, that is their, their kind of, their, their, their experiment, their their proof of concept is here in Alameda where I live. Um, so I walked away from Com. like I've been waiting for somebody to be a decent substitute for Comcast. So I get, you know, uh, you know, I'm promised 75 megs up, 75 megs down. I typically get 100. My ping time's under 10 seconds. I have no cap, and I pay 50 bucks a month, uh, which led to one of the funniest conversations I've ever had with a Comcast salesperson. Um, and uh, you know, I hope they are successful because we need alternatives to the major providers. Um, you know, Comcast and, and some of the others, but it's going to be, it's going to be tough because it requires money and patience and efforts. And if motherboard or vice, I should say, and you know, can actually make this happen. Awesome. If it inspires people, awesome. But I also think it's really frustrating. A lot of state legislatures have, have been like, well, we're going to do good things for large companies, even if it prevents small municipalities from being served. That is um, how they talk. That is how they talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. After the regular show yesterday, Tom and Roger and I were talking about the iMac Pro and and how, you know, not only is it expensive, but it's that whole Apple thing of, of, of not really being friendly to people who want to swap out RAM or otherwise get under the hood. Well, Apple announced it's developing a completely redesigned next generation Mac Pro and a new high end pro display. The company also described the new Mac Pro as a modular upgradable design. Now this news was buried. It was almost a throwaway really at the bottom of the company's new iMac Pro press release. So blink and you missed it. I actually did until today, uh, but it's you know kind of funny. We were just talking yesterday about like, why doesn't Apple make that more easy? Yeah. I, I'm curious about the modular part of this. Uh, right. up, upgradable seems pretty straightforward. Modular could mean a, an easier way to swap out internal components. It could also mean something either weird or cool that doesn't involve opening the case. I wonder if modular means dongles. Uh, I, <laughs> I, just, I just hope not. <laughs> Look, you can put it together. Technically, we all love, we all love a good connect connect technically, it's modular. Rob, do you have any hopes on this? You know, I've never, I've never used a, a Mac Pro. I've used MacBook Pros, 
But, um, you know, desktop system, it's been so many years since I've had one. I'm always a little envious when I see how rapidly you can do transformations in Photoshop and stuff like that. But good luck getting one of those suckers on a plane. Mm, so true. Uh, although you can take the current Mac Pro and just say it's a trash can and then they'll let you on. Thursday, security company FireEye disclosed that attackers took remote control of a workstation running a Schneider Electric Triconnect safety shutdown system and caused the halt of plant operations at an energy facility. They would not identify what facility or where. It is believed by a few other security companies that the target was in the Middle East, possibly Saudi Arabia. It's also believed the attackers were not trying to shut down the plant, that they were actually probing the system to infect it and modify safety systems and accidentally caused some controllers to enter fail safe mode, which brought the attack to the attention uh, of the company. So it's it's kind of arguable that this was the system working, that these 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 systems went into fail safe mode uh, in, uh, in response to the attack. Quick, let's shut out the lights in all of Saudi Arabia that will foil them. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it's better than having them have control because it sounds like what they were wanting to do yeah. was get into the safety system so that they could break uh, the energy facility later and cause damage. Yeah. yeah. Or flicker the lights. Yeah. Flickering the lights is annoying, but. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, know what, they were up. We don't know what they were up to. That's. Yeah. We that just don't. Spooky, right. Right. That is spooky when people start getting into the power grid. Well, something that we do know is that Bitcoin reached $17,800. Well, U.S. dollar on the Bitstamp Exchange Friday, continuing its accelerated rise of now 1,700% on the year. Good work, Bitcoin. SIBO Global Markets launched its Bitcoin futures market last Sunday, and CME Group is launching its future market this coming Sunday. So, Rob, you uh, had the CEO of Coinbase uh, on your show this week, uh, and, and I know you've been keeping an eye. Where, where are we at with Bitcoin as we record the show right now? So right now, I think it's at $17,665 and that all important one cent on Coinbase right now. It trades at different prices on different exchanges. So, you know, let's just sort of call that possibly a middle of the bell curve uh, trade uh, or, or price. And actually, I interviewed the co-founder who actually okay. left Bitcoin about a year ago. His name is Fred Ursum. And it was a really, um, it was an extraordinary interview, or is an extraordinary interview. I just put it up uh, about a day and a half ago, uh, because I've never interviewed somebody who's quite such a perfectionist. I mean, he really, we together, took it on as a goal that, like, let's create, let's structure a conversation. It's a spontaneous conversation, but let's structure it in such a way that somebody with only a glancing familiarity with Bitcoin could come in at the beginning and, you know, very, very quickly get up to speed so that when we get into these really crazy, bizarre, what might happen five years from now conversations, you know, even the novices could follow us all the way there. So we, we our goal was to make it something that was both a rigorous up uh, overview of the cryptocurrency domain and then also like a deep speculative talk that advanced folks uh, would get into. And Fred was just awesome because just the level of preparation and care that he put into it was amazing. And the result is I do think a really, really rigorous overview of the domain. I thought I knew it pretty well myself. I learned a ton from it. So that was kind of cool. So looking at the Bitcoin market and and knowing what you know now after, after getting this download from the co-founder of Coinbase, uh, are are we done? I mean, is this how much farther can get this go up? Because I'm I'm going to pull the veil back here on something. Yep. We recorded our holiday prediction special at the end of November, and one of my predictions was I think Bitcoin will pass fifteen thousand dollars next year because it had <laughs> just passed ten thousand, and I thought I was being you know I'll make a safe prediction that I know will work. Well, you know, silly me, I was actually being too conservative. Yeah, uh, so. Not that you know, but what's well, the did, general did, feeling did, about Bitcoin? Where this is Bitcoin will on, on New Year's Eve of 2018. Bitcoin will be trading at forty-two thousand three hundred eighty-six dollars and forty-seven cents. There you go, folks. You've heard it here first. You know, uh, so here's <laughs> here's the perspective that I have on it now. Um, when I first started getting interested in Bitcoin about five years ago, my feeling was this is going to be huge if and only if it becomes a, a you know a vibrant transactive medium. 
And my thinking for that was, look, we all have X dollars in our wallets that we carried around for daily transactions. We all keep Y dollars in our bank accounts for week to week, month to month. If this becomes an important transactive medium, we're all going to need these little and mid-sized and even large reserves of this currency. And since they, the, the uh, supply of Bitcoin grows at a mathematically precise and determined rate, the only way for the world to have enough Bitcoin for everybody to have you know, a few dollars in their wallet and a few more dollars in their bank account would be if the value of a Bitcoin starts to inflate to cover that. And over the last few years, Bitcoin has categorically failed to take off as a transactive medium. There are, in fact, fewer merchants accepting Bitcoin today than accepted it in 2014. I lost a lot of faith in it as a result of that. And um, But now, you know, I'm increasingly viewing it as simply a radically superior form of gold. Most of the things that gold does well, with the inevitable exceptions of creating gorgeous rings and conducting electricity, but as a store of value, as a way to keep things away from prying government eyes, as, a, as sort of a hedge against the banking system doing strange things, Bitcoin does all of that, but it does it so much better because of the portability. I mean, good luck crossing a national boundary or fleeing a burning house with 200 pounds of gold on your back. And the above ground value of gold, or the, the, the total value of the above ground gold is about $7 trillion right now. Now, some of that is on King Tut's stuff, some of it is conducting electricity, and some of it is doing things that Bitcoin sucks at. But trillions of dollars are being used for this purpose that, you know, kind of like when MP3 downloads first came out, people were like, yeah, but they're crappier than CDs. And that just felt intuitively correctly. And it took time to realize that, like, actually, no, this is kind of this weird digital thing that just feels wrong is actually better. And I feel like that's starting to happen with gold. And so that's why I look at Bitcoin's market valuation now at about $300 trillion, or a billion rather. And it seemed less crazy to me than it would have felt had it happened a couple of years ago when I was more expecting it to become a transactive medium, which it has failed to do. So Bitcoin is to gold as MP3s are to CDs. Well, maybe streaming music. Let's let's update ourselves now. Yeah. Streaming music is to CDs. In a certain sense, yeah. I mean, I as think the that- the founder of Rhapsody. As the founder of Rhapsody, he's a little biased toward this stuff, but that is high praise. No, I, th from. I think it's because you, you were there. Yeah. You, you saw there. this happen. And I think I that think makes that, it more yeah, worth 20, 20 years from now we can we can we can comfortably predict that it'll be a real weirdo with a retro fetish who uses cds and people are going to be streaming a great deal of music and i was never a gold bug it never made a great deal of sense to me because gold doesn't have an income it doesn't make quarterly reports it doesn't write dividend checks that was never my thing but it is the thing a lot of people yeah patrick real quick before we move on what you got uh, is i mean in, in terms of storing value gold style for people that are worried about you know everything isn't bitcoin considerably more manipulatable or do we do we know what's driving it up because it, it, the, the theories on this range from like a board hedge fund manager that wants to destroy a currency but is too noble to do it to any functioning currency to you know the chinese market control i mean the rise is kind of insane at this point can it the rise value? yeah the rise is insane but i'd say that we don't really know what drives the market price of Apple from day to day. When a market gets this large, nobody truly understands well, what, and people retroactively try to say, well, Apple was, not to, I mean, you do if there's an earnings report or something like that. Right. My theory with Bitcoin is, you know, it's, it's a lot more heavily traded than it was. For a long time, it was very thinly traded. And one pretty large decision maker saying, Damn it, I'm putting a lot of money into that mm -hmm. could really drive a, a price spike. One thing people don't appreciate, this is pretty interesting, about 20% of the Bitcoin allegedly in circulation is gone. It's disappeared. Yeah. Uh, people lose their hard drives. They lose their thumb drives. If we imagine that Bitcoin is used probably quite a bit these days, I would imagine, in large criminal transactions, uh, big drug dealers die all the time at the hands of other big drug dealers. And if, you know, a paranoid person who had big holdings in, book, in, in Bitcoin gets gunned down, that leaves the system. Satoshi, the pseudonymous person who created Bitcoin, has many, many, many billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, not one of which has ever been spent. So kind of one weird thing that goes on is that there's probably a lot fewer of them out there 
than we think. So the total market cap might actually be lower. Um, but you know what's been going on recently? There's been a big mania for Bitcoin in Korea. Uh, they are they've basically deregulated to an extent that any consumer who is excited about this can now walk into a store and pick it up. Right? Um, is that making a tulip bulb thing? I mean, I don't know. But I think Korea has been driving a lot of it recently. I have no opinion on what the price is going to be a year or two years from now. I could see it going to a thousand dollars. I could see it going to 100. Over the long term, I feel that the combined market caps of cryptocurrencies, those that succeed, are going to be a multi-trillion dollar asset class long term. Uh, the question is, is Bitcoin, which is you know kind of a rickety old code base compared to Ethereum and other things, is that going to be one of the giant winners? I don't know. I mean, there is a lot of network effect around money. A lot of people know the Bitcoin brand. A lot of people are holding it. A lot of people are accepting it. That would tend to give it legs. Um, but you know, ultimately I, I don't pretend to understand this stuff because if I did, I would have bought 10,000 of these things for a penny. Well, each. we've, we've now had a, uh, reference to the tulip bulb, uh, bubble and the teapot dome scandal in one week. Yeah. Kids ask your dead, great, great grandparents. <laughs> yeah. Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. And if you want to know more about Bitcoin, you're going to want to subscribe to after on we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit uh before we get on to that though patrick you've been keeping an eye on televisions and the home theater market in general what can we expect from tvs at ces and afterwards in the rest of 2018 well they're going to hold their value considerably less than gold or bitcoin <laughs> yeah, not a good investment um, okay yeah got not it. a good long-term investment uh as much as people might want to think they are um the big thing coming up is uh there's kind of like three or four big players right now. Um, we're not really going to see Vizio as one of the big players at uh, at CS 2018, but LG, Samsung, and TCL will be the ones to watch. Um, the basic rules when you're looking at TVs in 2018 or, or at the tail end of 2017, um, 4K is in the new 1080. Deal with it. Um, if it's bigger than you know 32 inches, it's probably a 4K TV now. Um, you really can't buy a TV that isn't smart. Um, most smart TV operating systems suck, and if they don't suck now, they'll probably suck 12 to 18 to 24 months from now when the updates that barely trickle out stop trickling, um, unless it's a Roku. And if it's not a Roku-based TV, you probably want to get a set-top box, whether it's a Roku box, an Apple TV box. Um, you know, I could go to a long list. Um, Shield TV, Android Shield TV. TV. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Android TV boxes are, are particularly interesting. Um, and 4K HDR TVs now start at around $300 if you're looking for something like a 32-inch TV. And a 32-inch 4K TV sounds really silly, although it may be a really interesting, inexpensive desktop monitor. Um, but HDR, which isn't going to be particularly well done on a $300 TV, uh, is kind of more interesting than the actual 4K resolution. So that's kind of like the ground rules for buying a TV. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, like, I'm really curious to see what TCL does because one of the big hits, um, you know, they did a $650, 55-inch TV, you know, that's that, that 55P60 or P607, um, 4K HDR was the wire cutter's pick. It's Robert Heron's pick. It's $649, occasionally goes up to $850, but that is a fantastic TV. There was supposed to be a larger version of that, but TCL didn't make it. Um, and I, a lot of people, myself included, are very curious to see what TCL is going to deliver in 2018, and we'll know about that at CES. And, you know, if they're going to do larger TVs, um, something that was crazy for me is when you look at like uh, there's Samsung uh, sells like 35 percent of the televisions in the United States. Sony's at maybe 12 percent. But Sony's televisions average like twelve hundred dollars this year, like the average television price from Sony, which is more than twice what the average price from Samsung or uh, LG is. And almost four times, I think, the average price of a TCL TV, which is to say that um, the big expensive TVs, like the wallpaper TV, it's two millimeters thin. It's a right. portal. The ones we're going to see it out of the CES coverage constantly. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that you know, $25,000 television, the OLED, um, okay, maybe not the 75 inch one, but when you start looking at like the 55, 60, 65 inch televisions, it's basically the same screen from the B series all the way up through the, oh my God, I could buy a car for that money series. I mean, is Sony still uh, being able to charge, you know, exponentially higher prices just because of brand recognition? I thought that that was something that <laughs> people were moving away from like five to 10 years ago. 
I, I agree with you entirely, but what Sony did, God bless them, uh, is long like they're, you know, like the Sony's cameras, they're using top of the line sensors and they're doing amazing things that no other camera company is kind of competing with. And in the case of the, the Sony television, the OLED televisions, the more expensive ones, they have, they're using the same panels basically that LG does. They're buying their panels from LG, but they're doing some really amazing processing and they're doing some really impressive, like they had that kickstand for the television, which sounds ridiculous, but every time I see one, I think I want to live in a loft in San Francisco with no furniture and white walls and this TV in the corner and it's going to be magnificent and I'm going to be cool like I thought I was going to be at 18, um, which I'm joking a little bit, but they're doing interesting things with design and they're doing interesting things like with the speaker system. Most speakers in television suck, um, but the ones in the Sony television, they actually basically turned the entire screen into a center channel so that the, the vocals appear to be coming from the people talking on the screen. So Sony's basically been like, we're going to do a, an expensive television. We're going to do different things from everybody else. We're going to try to create you know, a, a, something that's attractive for people who are willing to pay the price for. That acoustic surface is, you know, Rob was still talking about that two and a half months after he saw this TV at CES. And Rob never talks about a television Robert several Heron. months. It's not Robert, Robert Heron. So Robert never do. Uh, yeah, my co-host on EXL. You can find his uh, reviews and stuff up on Heron Fidelity. Dot com. Um, but it's a it's a gorgeous television. Uh, it's an interesting television, and I think that allowed them to to charge a premium. Um, but it's it's curious to watch, right? Because uh, Samsung needs to kind of catch up to LG. It, it, LG's kicked Samsung's ass in kind of overall image quality in 2017. So I think we're looking to see what Samsung does to kind of bridge the gap between their current quantum dot technology and OLED. So TCL, LG, Samsung, and Sony, mm -hmm. probably the first three I said more than Sony maybe, but Sony's yeah. got some interesting stuff going on. And then buzzword wise, I should keep an eye out for, or an ear out for micro LED and emissive quantum dots. Yeah, that's what we're, you know, at some point, quantum dot technology is going to generate the light itself, which will eliminate the backlight, uh, which is a really compelling thing. It's kind of like the, the holy grail of quantum dot technology. So that's the, the emissive part. I get it. Okay. Yeah, it's going to emit. Um, how, long, how long from now would that, is, is that likely to happen? And is that five years now, 10 years? I think we're going to see announcements on it this year. I don't think we're going to see televisions this year. Um, They've been a little, you know, cagey about how far along the technology is. Uh, you know, I'll say two years, and if I say two years, then they'll introduce it at CES this year. <laughs> yeah, a low single-digit number of years. Yeah, it's pretty close. Or at and least it sounds like it's really shatters close. precedent. Is that something that's like a new TV, a, a TV of the sort we just simply haven't seen, or is that kind of like, yeah, it's a nice little incremental improvement? The, the really big one for, you know, it's one of those. It's one of those things like. You know, in tech thing this week we talked about um, Atmos that's showing up in video games, right? So it's the theater technology slash home theater technology where you either have ceiling speakers in the ceiling or speakers that bounce against the ceiling and they create this huge collection of sound kind of above your head. Best example I've heard is the opening to Gravity when the meteorites start mm -hmm. going through. I don't think that's a spoiler. It's an incredible audio experience, right? It changes the way they design audio, blah blah blah. Um, you know, there's you know, 178 or something titles, a whole bunch of Blu-ray titles on that. They're streaming it on Netflix and Vudu. Um, but right now there's like eight, eight video games that have Dolby Atmos. Um, yeah. So it's one of those things like, you know, HDR, I wouldn't want to, if you're going to own a TV for five years, try to make sure it's a TV with HDR. If you're, you know, the kind of person that buys a television every year, I don't know what to tell you to do other than spend lots of money and drive the economy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Uh, helps us figure out what to talk about each day. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and join in our Facebook group and talk about all this stuff. If you want to talk about emissive quantum dots or micro LED or Dolby Atmos, go join some other people at facebook.com slash group slash daily tech news show. Let's check the mailbag, Sarah. Let's. This one comes from Marcus Hall. And, you know, a lot of people are seeing Star Wars or already have or will this weekend or soon. Marcus says, I was wondering if perhaps one effect of Disney buying Fox Studios might be to transfer Star Wars production back to Fox so we can get the proper fanfare at the beginning of the movie. No matter how great the movies are and The Last Jedi is great, it just doesn't seem right without the 20th Century Fox opening. There are I so many things note in our doc earlier where I was like, so true. Like that's yes. what makes me cry at the beginning of Star Wars. There are so many things to talk about uh, in this acquisition that's going to take a year and a half to complete. So we'll, <laughs> we'll have plenty of time, I guess. But uh, but yeah, this is one that hadn't occurred to me. I'm like, oh yeah, I want the I want that back. I don't even care if it's actually Fox involved. I just want that noise yeah. 
at the beginning. It probably I wasn't at the top of why this acquisition happened, but no. maybe a really good side product. <laughs> Iger wanted the 20th Century Fox opening. I you know, it didn't even occur to me. I didn't think about anything until. Oh, see, it's like it's like part of the, the whole thing to me. That I asked to start that way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's uh, check in with Len Peralta to find out what he has been drawing amongst all of this lovely tech news. Len, what do you got for us? Well, you know, this week there was a lot of big stories. Of course, the biggest one, uh, <laughs> Sound Blaster, coming out yeah, with their new... Okay. No, I'm kidding. No, you know, you got net neutrality. I say it for the retro show, Len. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> of course, you have uh, net neutrality and uh, The Last Jedi. So what did I do? I mashed them up. You know, the name Agit Pai, if you think about it, it sounds a lot like a Star Wars villain. And that's what I did. So, uh, you know, Drew Ajitai so as uh, as Kylo Ren holding his enormous Reese's coffee cup, which is sort of baffling. And uh, I thought that was Photoshop. I didn't realize I thought so. Was I thought that so too. Uh, and he's using a line that Kylo Ren says from the Last Jedi trailer: "Let the net die, kill it if you have to." And um, who knows? That might be what he may have done. I don't. I don't think he's killed the net but you know no, i don't either uh but but len really uh if people thought we were too even-handed with yesterday's conversation about this <laughs> now they've got your art there you go yeah you know i just thought maybe this is kind of scratching a niche for somebody out there this is like, yeah let it go over the edge why not <laughs> uh but yeah you can pick this up uh right now at uh lenperaltastore.com and of course this is the last weekend to order my uh uh, uh custom drawn holiday cards i'm taking orders till the 20th so uh, you may want to get your order in i can take care of it for the holidays start so excellent len peralta store.com thanks also to patrick norton patrick if people want to know more about your wealth of knowledge about hgtvs or ktvs <laughs> or i don't know and everything else where do they go uh, avxl.com is a great place to learn about home theater robert and i will be doing some coverage from ces this year um, big announcements. Most of those are going to hit on Tuesday. And uh, techthing.com. T e k t h i n g. dot com. Come Excellent. join the fun. And we're excited to hang out with you guys at CES. Thanks also to Rob Reed, cryptocurrency extraordinaire. <laughs> Where do people learn more about what you're up to, Rob? So uh, my podcast is at after-on.com, and uh, this week's episode is the long interview with Fred Ursum. Um, and you know, every week or sometimes every other week, I talk to a different world-class expert in a domain. It might be genomics, it might be augmented reality, it might be quantum computing, uh, might be terrorism. I talked to Sam Harris several weeks ago, and we try to get really, really deep in a way that can take the listener from passing familiarity to ideally top percentile understanding of a domain because you know it's a long, in-depth, unhurried conversation. And this week, it is cryptocurrency. Go check it out, folks, after-on.com. Uh, if you were intrigued by Sarah mentioning that we were talking about the upgradability of Max, and you want to hear that conversation, it was, in fact, recorded as the bonus episode that goes out to everyone who supports us at the co-executive producer level or above. You can become a patron at that level or become a patron at all. You can get our pre and post show and everything at patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have questions, comments, feedback, anything, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is our email address. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back on Monday with Veronica Belmont. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> ah, oh, such a good show, you guys. Thank you. Such Yay. a good show. Thank you. Almost wish it was like an hour. Yeah, it could have been a round table. I talk. All that stuff. That's why we need more round tables in our. Uh, yeah. Very good point. Good, good stuff. What should I'd we like call it? Pat Patrick, I like the Philly Cooley uh, t-shirt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it is my Josh. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, Rob Reed, do you know where I first saw Philly Cooley?
uh, was my wife in some way involved? Because she was in Morgan here. Webb's apartment in San Francisco yeah. a long, long time ago. Long, long time ago. Yeah. 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 She, I, that's how I encountered Philly Cooley was through Morgan Webb as well. It was Morgan and my friend Josh Lawrence, both like, like, got a bunch of us to come over and watch of it. Law. Crazy. It is an amazing show. Yeah. I'm terrified that they're going to do a season two and season three. What? I exactly that was that's that one was, of those things that they shouldn't touch. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I heard that and I was just like, part of me is like, I am curious, and part of me is like, they're gonna it up. Um, well, you know, season two and season three of Rick and Morty have been just fine, yeah, but it's Rick and Morty isn't a, a long stringing thread story, right? Like each episode yeah. you can watch. You can. Even if you've never there seen the show, there is an art, but yeah, I mean yeah. the pillows. I mean, yeah, there's an arc, good. but there you can. I mean, it's kind of like South Park. There's an arc in each season, but you can jump in into an episode and laugh sure. at it. You can. Yeah. yeah. Um, I right, think with Philly Cooley, you can you can jump in in any given second and not know <laughs> what's going on and be completely great. lost. <laughs> this is just like a yeah. Uh, does modular mean dongles? Who will miss aim? Aiming toward oblivion, Full House Friday, Sarah Lane rocks and typing a message. Give us your aim <laughs> memories. I wonder if modular means dongles, deep dish Bitcoin, modular max dongles how not about, required. How about aimless? Aimless. Ooh, that's oh. good. <laughs> Only reason I started using aim is because I had to use it at CNET. Uh, you know, I used aim because there were a couple people, for whatever reason, we just never really started texting we just that's the way we communicated um so i guess they're not my friends anymore no nope, that's <laughs> it that's what this means yeah done done i was aim. using aim at tech tv because we were using it to communicate and there like oh yeah i remember when it first launched and you could you could integrate this is even before aol owned Nets netscape uh it was integrated into netscape communicator and I remember thinking, this is stupid. I can just email someone and they get it immediately. Why do I need an instant messenger? Isn't that funny? Well, and then there was like the era of Trillion where you could like combine oh. your mess messenger oh, services. Oh, yeah, I was a big Trillion user. Well, you know, I, use, I use Pigeon, so it does that. I use Pigeon too, yeah. They're all over, Pigeons. I thought that uh, texting on the iPhone was AIM because it just borrowed, it just stole the interface. Well, yeah, because I because the iMessage in OS X was integrated with AIM, right? For a while, uh, it still is. Well, well, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> not as of not today, as of today but, yeah, but yeah, like but I, it was. I, I, yeah, you're right. I only knew it stopped working because Pigeon started having trouble connecting to AIM, to the AIM server. It's like, oh, disconnected. It's like, oh wait, oh, that's why right. you shut it off. All gone. All of it done. Uh, title aimless. Aimless. Yeah. Top. Do it. I like that one. Sounds like a Netflix series. It aimless. does. <laughs> it's the uh, it's the Netflix series based on You've Got Mail. Oh God. <laughs> I was gonna make this joke. Like I I was like too bad AOL wasn't based in Seattle because we could say aimless in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally out of cool puns. That's great. No, I like that. <laughs> It's of course you would, Tom. Well, it's not, it's not puns with incorrect. Tom. People in Seattle will be aimless. Just, you know. They're just a subset of the aimless. planetary population that will also be aimless. <laughs> but Sleepless in Seattle is You've Got Mail. They're the same movie, right? They're the same movie. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. literally just got the actors together and did the same movie. Yeah. And then they paid that guy, right, who did the voice. They paid him that says You Got Mail for that movie. Well, at least he got paid to do something because I think he just got minimum wage to say you've got mail like eight. No, I thought the whole thing was he got. Oh, he, yeah, I thought, I thought he got like a stack just to do that movie. Stack just to say. Well, it. hopefully same, so. Was it the real, the same voice, or just somebody? Who yeah, no, it was. It was. It was supposed to be the. Um, you've got mail. No, I know. Oh, but oh. Like, was it just you know for the movie, or was it actually you know they licensed that little clip? You've got mail pattern baldness. <laughs> That's a riff tracks joke. <laughs> All oh, people man. are cool. Yeah. That is my stance. You've got mail. I am 
I am. Okay. I'm apathetic. A friend of mine uh, was working at Apple in the mid '90s when the new, the then new MacBook Power Books came. Out, right. Uh huh. Wanted to load them up with a bunch of different sounds, and they had this sort of competition in the cafeteria of who is going to make the duck quack. Like all employees were welcome to come and like make a quacking sound into a microphone, and my buddy won his his quack. Oh, in- really? <laughs> millions and millions of <coughs> macbook pros and um you know and so now he's 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 had a you know great career and he's he's got a lovely family a couple of kids um but he's starting to you know fear that maybe that was despite all of that maybe that was his high point you yeah because like that's you know that's big right you i know. know that duck quack like i can hear it in my head right now you can and and yeah. when you, when you met him and you had a mac you're like oh my god that's totally him uh-huh it is that's totally amazing. him. i mean is that just a tech version of uh peaking in high school when you occasionally run into the, or college like high like high college sports yeah but it's it's peaking in something that you know like the you got mail like that you got mail guy he exists right like yeah he he lives in ohio and apparently he does uber as a side gig wow but like how many people have heard him say this sentence like or how many times has that been heard by human ears how many neurons has he lit up like he's got to be in a league with you know like presidents and prime ministers that he's the voice behind welcome you've got mail no way Do it. Yeah. he's driving the <clears throat> the uber and what you're playing right yes he's driving the well it's parked he's not doing it while oh, he's driving. right he's not driving while he talks but he's in the driver's seat yeah, yeah driving while talking is a very difficult thing to do very it is. yeah I, I, I don't know uber driver <laughs> capable of that <laughs> Lift drivers know. can do it, but not Lyft Uber. drivers can. That's part yeah. of the that's part of the onboarding process. You need to totally. know how to talk and drive at the same time, right? I mean, grab taxi. That's one of those things you start worrying about when you get older. At least I do. It's like, do I peak already? I'm done. <laughs> it. it doesn't get oh, any yeah. better. No, I definitely peaked long oh, time. Here's your, I, I, here's I know your, I've peaked. Here's your, here's your Hillshire Farm That's fine. cheese log. That's fine. Just get used to it. <laughs> and your gold bow. Go. Any bright, shiny moments of joy you have, Roger, be desperately thankful for them because you'll get fewer and fewer. I know. Long, terrible for some reason, reason this reminds me of the golden corn trophy that you showed me on eBay once, Patrick. <laughs> I love is those that, things. Is that your parenting advice? Oh God, no, no! Um, my parenting. <laughs> I'm torturing Roger because you know Roger and I have been torturing other for 20 years now, but the uh, or almost 20 years. No, that was uh, DeKalb corn. I, I think I have a half dozen DeKalb corn trophies now. Yeah, and I will have more. <laughs> I haven't looked on eBay for a DeKalb corn. You're trophy. gonna have an entire bushel soon. What are they exactly? Ever see? Uh, a, so, if you grow up in the Midwest and you drive around the middle of nowhere, um, you see they they put these signs next to exper- basically where they're either growing a particular type of seed, or if they're running experiments or like demo stations for farmers to come check out the growth of a particular product. And call was is this very distinctive. It's an ear of corn with green wings on it, and it's it's a fantastic uh, image. It's just a fantastic piece of graphic design, and uh, I've been obsessed with it since I was very small. And at some point, I realized that in the fifties and sixties, um, DeKalb was given trophies like you know the biggest producer in the county or the bloody bloody blah or the biggest purchase whatever it was. And there are these crazy, you know, there's like a desk set and trophies and wall plaques with you know these an ear of corn with wings on it. So it's ah, like the it Oscars be. of sorghum sort of. Yes. Thing. Yeah. I am an ear of corn with wings. There it is. <laughs> oh my God. That looks, that looks weird. How are you? I represent DeKalb corn. <laughs> you would get when you go to that corn palace, is it in Nebraska? You know, that, big thing they, that big thing they built out of corn. Morgan and I did a corn maze once. It was pretty fun. A maze maze? Like a maze. Like we got lost in the freaking corn maze. But, you know, it's, they, they set it up around harvest time and, you you know, it's a maze. Ma- uh, we made did out one of, for made out of maze. Oh, wow. The corn oh, palace is actually God, that's Mitchell's good. South I don't know Dakota. how we failed to make that joke on that day. <laughs> we did. Uh, because you have sense? I don't know. 
<laughs> Might be a kernel of truth in that one. Hey, uh, there's an example of not having restraint. <laughs> Tom is all ears. You are popping off with puns again. Wow. <laughs> Don't get too syrupy. Uh, every time one of the boys makes a pun, I look at him and be like, you've been talking to Tom again, haven't you? And they give me this look like, what are you talking about? Who's that? <laughs> Someday it will all come together. Oh, my goodness. All uh, right. I am going to log off. All right. Uh, have a lovely weekend. Enjoy Star Wars. Yes, I will. I Don't will. Don't spoil Thank it. Much. No, we'll not spoil it at all. I, I, I heard R2 did it. <laughs> you did it. It's yeah. Come on, Rob. Whatever it was. <laughs> of course R2, R2 did, did it. How come they're going to go now? Uh, Ruiner. That's, that's how there's so many R2 units. Have a good Star Wars weekend, everybody. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks, Len. Bye -bye. Take care. Thanks, Bye -bye. one and all. Care, I got to I gotta roll, too. All right. Thanks again, Rob. That was great. Bye, Cheers, Rob. 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 Say bye to uh, Portugal. I will. Say hi to Morgan for me. I will do that. Say hi to Morgan Webb. Hi. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, my goodness. Roger, are you stopping the broadcast? Stop in broadcast now.